Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Stephen Braun. I'm a con consulting anthropologist in Anchorage, out of Anchorage, since 1978. And do I turn that on? Or? There we go. And we, in addition to conducting the cultural resource study that you heard about this morning, we were commissioned by Northern Dynasty at that time in 2004 to do the subsistence and traditional knowledge studies. And at that time, I think we were supposed to be done with everything in 18 months. So that was 2004, it's now 2012. Uh, we more or less developed this program as we went along using information that we'd that I'd acquired over the years. I worked with uh, Dr. Jack Cruz, retired professor from UAA Institute of Social and Economic Research, and I have a, a quite a young and competent staff that have worked with me. So the, the purpose was to establish a sufficient baseline description to characterize subsistence uses in the study area. So then we have, I'm going to show you in a minute what the study area is because that was a long debate. What constitutes the study area for, at that time, all we knew that there would be some kind of a mine, a transportation corridor in some general area going towards Cook Inlet and some sort of a port facility somewhere in Cook Inlet. So we don't need to know a lot about a project to be able to do our work to characterize a baseline environment. We, if it's offshore oil and gas, we understand the parameters of that. If it's a mine, we understand that. So what we do when we do all the interviews and go in the field, we're, we of course introduce who we are and why we're on a project, but we don't bring the project into our field work. We're basically trying to gather information unbiased by the project or where the mine might be or a road and so on. So the goal was to characterize sufficient, and that word in there is we know that this information is going to be used at some point to do an impact analysis for environmental consequences. So we're well aware of that. So loaded in that word sufficient to us is sufficient to characterize a, a environment, but also sufficient to enable some, a third party to come along and say, oh, adequate information is here to be able to do an impact analysis in the future. And early on, to inform project design, that was whatever information we had, whatever we were reporting to Pebble, they could use to inform their design of their project, which has not occurred much since the early days because we haven't been involved at that level of a design of a project at all. In broad overview, we have three parts to this study, the traditional knowledge and subsistence. And when I got this contract and started, I had to think about, well, how can we best do this? I've done work throughout Alaska by, that, by then. I've been to Bristol Bay. I've done work in those communities in the 80s and in the 90s, so I kind of knew the territory. And I thought, well, how, how can we do the very best job? So, of course, a literature review, compilation of existing subsistence data and information, that was a given. We knew we had to re review all the existing information, including all of the map data. And I've always had an affinity for maps and geography and making maps. And we've developed, as you'll see, some intriguing ways of gathering map, subsistence map data and representing it. But I, I was also aware that starting in the, in the mid, I think, 1978, there was a, at that time a subsistence section in ADF and G, now a division. And they'd done a lot of work throughout the community. They did household surveys subsistence harvest amounts, some mapping, economic information. So I knew that they, they existed, and I thought, boy, there's no point in stopping something that's working well. So I went to the client and said, look, I think I should subcontract to the Division of Subsistence to do their studies, their household survey, arm's length. They can implement what they already do, in, and they've done 250 times or something at that time in communities, and they agreed. So that's the second part of this program is we have the Division of Assistance Household Survey Reports. And that's going to be, Dave and Holland's going to talk about that. So that was a subset of the, of the project. And then third, we had our subsistence use area and traditional knowledge interviews in our reporting. And in that report, 
although we focus on the findings of our field work, we try to implement and, and bring in the ADF and G baseline information. <coughs> and in our report, in the, in the environmental baseline document, the chapter itself is rather skimpy at this time. It's most, mostly, <coughs> excuse me, methodology because we have an appendix for each of the community reports. And I'll get into that later, but uh, so each at the bottom bullet down there, there's individual community reports as an appendix. So that goes to the <coughs> study area. So what, as you can imagine, what would your study area be for subsistence if you have something, if you're putting a mine at the headwaters of both the Nutri excuse me, in the Quijack Rivers and Lake Iliamna, Lake Clark is down there and and so we took a broad, we took a broad, very broad approach. And we said, okay, residents who are going to use that mine area or road area or port area, wherever that is in the general area, if someone uses that area, they're certainly in the study area. But furthermore, if they use resources that go through that study area, we're going to put those communities in the study area. So now you have the whole downstream kind of effect. So we went downstream. So at the broadest scale, we ended up with all the communities in Lake Clark and Illiamna areas. <coughs> Downriver, we had 20 communities. So that was our study area. Then we also knew from other work we'd done that there's a potential that people on the Kenai Peninsula, on the east side Kenai Peninsula, would go to the west side and they could be affected potentially by if there's a port facility over there. So we said we're going to also include those communities in the broad study area. So back in 2004, I made this map, and it didn't have Lyme Village in it at that time, and it didn't have Tyonic in it at that time, but it did have these kind of shaded circles. And at that time, I was trying to think, well, even though that's the biggest study area, you don't want to tell a new client who gives you a project to say, well, we got to go do field work in 20 places. So I tried to prioritize them and say, well, hmm, maybe there'd be a more direct effect in the areas closer to the mine and maybe a more indirect effect the further way, further you are from them. And so we set up a tier of communities. I had tier one, tier two, and tier three. And that lasted about 10 minutes to when I got to a meeting in Equoc in two, October 2004 and there were people from tier two and tier three at that meeting and they stood up and said, no way. Even though we may live in Dillingham, that potential project is up in water, headwaters that come down by us. We are just as vulnerable. We're not second class citizens. We're just as vulnerable being downriver. So I threw that whole thing out, wrote a memo to Northern Dynasty and said, I think I want to abandon our initial approach of tiering these communities and we're going to treat them all the same and we're going to so all 20 are the same and now these shaded areas just represent the schedule of when we went somewhere not that any one's more or less important well then when I contacted Fish and Game they were already doing their household surveys I think in Pedro Bay and, and maybe Nundalton and one of the community Port Allsworth or w some subset of that for the Park Service, so we joined, I, I subsidized that with Pebble Northern Dynasty at that time funds and hired them. And so they, through time, have had the same scope of study communities that we had, 20 communities. So that was the goal in both cases. When, as we did our field work, people in Dundalton said, hey, if we can't get our, our subsistence foods, we, we communicate and share with Lyme Village, you've got to include Lyme Village, and so we did. Same thing with Tyonic. They said, you know, Tyonic are related to us, Athabasta, they've come down here at different times. You've got to include Tyonic. So we did, although we did the same study for that community, for Tyonic, for the Chuit Nicole project, so we didn't do it under the umbrella of this project, but we did it, but we, it is included. The, the, the data are there. Now, our job is to provide an adequate baseline to me, this is my perspective, so the next third party or someone doing an EIS or an impact analysis, they have all the information they need to the best of our ability to go do that. So whether the Tyonic is in the baseline report for Pebble or not, but it's available, that, that's all that was important to us. So we didn't try to duplicate that study. 
So I'm going to go through this slide and then turn it over to David because they did their household surveys, I think, in 18 communities, and he can go into that. And their standalone report from the division. And to me, that was really important that we didn't try to influence at all what the Division of Subsistence did. We said, give us your standard procedure report, what you do for your typical household surveys. It's arm's length. You do your field work. You do your report. And the only thing we tried to influence is we said, but we want mapping. And so we worked with them and made sure that every one of their documents that represents one year of information, so they did the one year, had one year of mapping. And we worked with them to do that. They have household service, sur surveys. They have residency, employment, harvest amounts. David will go through all this, and we're incorporating that into our baseline. So now I'm going to let David talk about the ADF and G household surveys, and I'm going to come back and talk about the subsistence mapping and TK part. Okay, so so this has got to be you. No, that's not you. Hold on. What's the what's the name of yours? Show me what. Show me which one it is on there. It says Keystone. I know I had it on there. What did I do with it? <coughs> I can load it again real quick. Okay. Sometimes it's faster. It's not that. Is it? Is this it? No, it's not it. Huh. Okay. Let's back into it. Okay, thanks for your patience. Um, once again, my name is David Holland, and I'm the subsistence program manager for Southern Region. Um, I'm also the principal investigator on this project. This was a five-year project for us. Um, the Southern Region, just to give you an idea, we cover um, everything from the Aleutian Islands uh, through the inter uh, inter southern interior of Alaska all the way to southeast. Um, so we have quite a large region with um, only about eight researchers. Um, and so it's, it's quite a, <clears throat> that's why we, uh, we, we can only get to some of these communities every so often. Um, one of the things that, that Steve mentioned is that we have just a one-year snapshot of these communities. Of course, there are quite a few communities in southern Alaska that are rural communities, and so we can't do these type of surveys every year. But um, we do them as they come up, and we do them as uh, funding becomes available. And that's an important component of this, um, whether um, the funding comes from the, through a subcontract from uh, Steve Braun and Associates or the National Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, or once in a while the state actually pays for a survey. Um, it, we do them regardless. We do them exactly the same. Um, and so that's, that's how we, we, we function. We, we try to present the data in an objective manner. Just to give you a little bit of background about the Division of Subsistence, we are, like I mentioned, a very small component of fishing game, about eight researchers within an um, uh, infinite amount of biologists at the Department of Fishing Game. Um, so um, the subsistence law has been around since 1978, and um, the, the things that are important to, to understand here is that our job is to provide information about the customer and traditional use of resources 
to establish customer international use and then provide information about the amounts necessary for subsistence. And the only way we can do that is through surveys like this or some kind of permit system where we actually ask people to record their fish harvest, for example. Um, over 30 years, we've worked in almost 220 communities in rural Alaska. Um, we are constantly busy trying to keep up uh, because of our small staff, um, but we are, we are starting to grow a little bit and, um, and, and actually getting some funding from the state to do some of our research. So it's, it's, been, a, it's been a little bit of a transition for us as we try to keep up. We, we, this is our research focus. Um, we look at the seasonality of fishing, hunting, and gathering. We are mainly staffed by anthropologists um, that have worked with um, mainly rural communities in Alaska. Um, and quite often those are indigenous communities. So we try to understand seasonality from an indigenous perspective, um, at the role of the season as it plays in subsistence harvests. We look at methods of harvesting processing sharing of, of, of wild foods. Uh, the sharing of wild foods or subsistence foods is very important uh, within economies in rural Alaska. We look at um, the areas of harvest and use and the mapping that we've been collecting uh, for this project and for others is, is very important. Um, and uh, through this process that we've worked with with Steve's staff over the last few years, we've really developed a very robust mapping methodology. And because of this project, we have employed that methodology across all of our projects. And we do that um, uh, continuously from now on. Um, GIS has become a large part of what we do. Um, and it's something that I'm really interested in. Like Steve, I love maps. I love making maps and you know, working in GIS. And unfortunately, as a program manager, I don't get to do that so much anymore. But uh, I, I, I make sure to hire staff that can do it now. Um, we look at cultural, social, and economic values. Um, of course, the, the social values attached to subsistence. And like I mentioned, the sharing. Uh, trends in harvest and use patterns. Like I mentioned, this is a one-year snapshot. This year it will not be the same as every year. So, um, there are always changes in, in um, populations. There's changes in harvest patterns that happen. So we try to understand that within the context. And I'll talk about assessments that we do as part of our survey to understand changes over time. And then we looked at resource issues that need resolution. Well, here's one. So um, working in, we are social scientists and we, we abide by strict ethical standards. When working in communities, we try to create local government, partnerships with local governments and agencies. Uh, we always write a letter of induction to the community, describe what we're going to do. We ask them if there is a tribal entity in the community that they sign a, um, a resolution supporting the project. Um, we, exp we go out and do a scoping meeting with them, regardless of the community. Um, for example, I'll be in Talkeetna tomorrow, giving a, a scoping meeting for that area. Um, even though there's no tribal government, we still want to ensure that everybody is informed of what we are doing and that they are comfortable with us being in the community. And I'll talk about what happens if they're not comfortable uh, here in a minute. We always uh, try to hire local research assistants. Um, that is very beneficial on both parts. One, we can provide a little employment. Um, those people are the experts. Uh, we recognize that. We are not the experts. Um, and uh, the other part of that is if a person like me, you know, um, a white guy from Wasilla who works for Fish and Game, knocks on your door asking about your harvest, are you going to talk to me? Probably not. Um, so we try to um, we try to provide um, have local people help us out because they they're the best ones at translating what we're trying to do to their in their community, and, and and they like I said they are the experts. We always conduct the research face to face. We don't do this over the phone or anything mm -hmm. like that. They're face to face interviews, and part of that is we want people to be comfortable with the information they're giving it to us. Um, we have a community review meeting at the end of the project. We ask people, here's the information we collected. What do you think? Does it look accurate? Are you comfortable with this? Um, if they aren't, we make changes um, to that. Um, we provide a draft final report for review. We, we send them out a final report. We always give a report to the funding agency. And finally, we enter that data into what they call the community subsistence information system. Um, and that is an online database that is available through the Department of Fish and Game website. You can go there. You can search any community we worked in and pull all of our data. Um, and it's very helpful, especially for me, when I'm out working or I'm at a board meeting and I need information quickly. 
Um, but it, we always tell people that's a great resource to use if you're writing a proposal for the boards of fisheries or game to change regulations. Use that database. Um, our methodology, we have, we have employed a, a standard survey instrument. Like I said, it's across whatever um, projects we're working on. It includes demographics the, of the community, uh, individual participation in harvesting activities um, overall, household harvesting use activities. So we have it at the individual level by major species category. And then for the actual species and the details, we do it at the household level. Uh, we look at assessments of changes over time, uh, harvest locations and search areas. I want to mention that there are some things that we do not publish the harvest locations for like moose, for example. We're, we're not in the business of making a great hunting map for people to use. Um, we just do general kind of search areas, but we do catalog all that data and, and keep it because um, there are times for like the boards, board of game, for example, it's been incredibly useful especially to provide date, uh, harvest locations by month to demonstrate the importance of a winter hunt, for example. Why is that winter hunt important? Um, so we, we do keep all that data, but we don't publish it in the technical paper series. We have jobs and income. These are rural communities, are mixed economies. Um, we, we find that you know, it takes money to do subsistence. You've got to buy a boat, snow machines, four-wheelers, guns, fish nets, all of those things. It takes money to, to do subsistence in today's economy. Um, and so, and that's a really important part of it. It also looks at the sharing comp component of that. And we've done some um, analysis. We didn't do it for this project, but other projects we even looked at, uh, at analysis of sharing between households at a really detailed level. And then we record comments and concerns. We do not go into the household saying, um, do you have any questions and comments about the Pebble Project, for example? We just say, do you have any questions and comments or concerns? And they can talk about whatever they want. Um, and so that's really important to understand. We also conduct key, key respond interviews. These are very brief interviews to provide context for the data. The data sets out on their own are important, but we also need to understand the context in which they exist. So this is the area I'm really going to focus on. It's just those areas there. Household harvest assessment, assessments of changes, um, harvest locations, and search areas for the context of this presentation. These are the communities we worked in. Um, we, we started off looking at the, at the area right around the mine sites. Um, that was the focus. We were all going to be working in those areas for the Park Service. And so like Steve mentioned, we just uh, added on a couple extra communities and we did a more robust mapping. Um, in the second year, we, we focused on the areas of the south side of Iliama Lake to kind of close up the, the Quijack watershed drainage. And then we started looking at communities on the, on the Nushigak River for that drainage as well, um, Kaliganik and New Stuyahawk. Ekwok, um, we approached them several times to ask if they wanted to be part of this project and they declined each time very politely, but they, they declined. We do not work in communities that they don't want us there. And so that's, and that's very important for us. I mean, they have to recognize the utility of the information, the benefit, and if they decide that, that, that they don't want to have us there, then we, we, won't, we won't work in that community. We then started, um, we looked at communities, um, you know, at the outlet of the Quijack River, that was Naknik, um, King Salmon, and South Naknik those three communities. And, and we added on Lime Village that year. Um, that is the first time we'd ever done a study in Lime Village, actually. Um, and you'll see that it was really quite interesting based on their per capita harvest. And uh, we, we're going to be going back to that community soon to do a whitefish study. And, and that's really kind of the outcome of this project is we've, we've discovered places that maybe do need some more research uh, to understand. Um, in the following, a uh, year we, we went out and did Aleknigig, gig, um, Clark's Point, and Manakotic, uh, those communities. Um, and that was the fourth year of the study. And then finally we ended on Dillingham. And Dillingham is a large community. It took a very complicated sampling strategy. And so we waited till the very end to get that. So that we have 18 communities in total. So this is uh, how it looked over time. Um, these are, this is the pounds per capita, or the, the harvest. You know, if you take the entire population of the community, you, you add in all of the edible weight 
Um, so it's just edible weight um, of, a, of a resource um, and, in multi and then divide that by the number of people in the community. And you can see here that there are some communities where there's a, a high harvest. Um, the average harvest in Alaska is somewhere between 320 and 350 pounds per person in rural communities. That has declined in the last few years, but not very much. If you look at the difference between 2000 and 2010, for example, it really hasn't declined that much. So a lot of these communities, especially in Bristol Bay, really fit within that. And I'll talk about the, the composition of some of those harvests here in a minute. Um, and one of the reasons I, I mentioned Lime Village, it, it was great to work there, as you can see the high uh, per capita harvest. Um, it's a very remote community. They only get a plane in there every once in a while. Um, so, for example, when I sent them the introduction letter, it took them two months to respond because they just got the letter. Um, and you can see that other communities do have high harvests as well. Um, but all of them, it's, it's, except for the, the case of Port Allsworth, are over 200 pounds per capita. And that's averaged out by every single person in the community. So these are just some brief findings of, of, of our research. I do not have time to go into, of course, all of the findings. Um, this is uh, the second year, um, Igiagig, Kaknak, Kalignik, Leavlock, New Stew, um, looking at the, the percent of the individual resource categories, for example, um, as part of the overall harvest. And I guess, of course, the one thing to point out is the blue bar at the bottom, and that is salmon. Uh, for Bristol Bay, salmon, as, as terms of edible weight and, and the amount of harvest and processing that goes into them, uh, do constitute quite a large uh, portion of the harvest. Uh, large land mammals, of course, are also important. Um, you can see, for example, the community of Leeblock, almost half their harvest in terms of edible weight was um, large land mammals. Uh, this was back in 2005. Uh, the Mulchatna caribou herd has moved out of this area since that time. Um, they should probably be called the Upper Cuscoim herd by now. Um, but they, are, they, are, they will eventually come back. And that's one thing about learning about traditional knowledge in these communities. People talk to us about that. You know, this is a natural cycle. They stay for a while, they go somewhere else, then they can always come back. Um, so that's part of that. And, and of course, moose since the 1940s have been important resources in this community since they showed up. This is um, Electing Gig, Clarks Point, Manicotic. Um, very similar type of, of, of harvest, um, although you can see we, we are starting in, to get into the importance of marine mammals as well in these communities um, down in Bristol Bay. And so they do have a higher harvest. You can see Clark's Point. Clark's Point did have a high per capita harvest, and I don't know if you noticed that in that bar. It was very high. Uh, there are some main hunters there, and they share their resources with people in Dillingham. And so although the, a lot of the harvest happens in that community, we did go back, we verified the harvest to make sure we were, had the numbers right, that we weren't making a mistake because it was so high. And that's what they related, that they share a lot of it with people in Dillingham. So although you see the Dillingham per capita harvest, the lower, they do have a lot of resources coming in from relatives and friends that live in other communities. And they do a lot of sharing and, and participation with those, those folks in other communities. And this is uh, our last one, Dillingham, um, that we just uh, are just writing up. Um, we're about to we're about a month away from publishing, and this will be the last report in this series of six reports. Um, we did do two reports for one year because we added Lime Village, and I I felt that Lime Village needed its own report because it was so different than the other communities. One thing I wanted to point out was individual levels of participation. We have very high levels of participation in harvesting. Uh, and this is um, the, the first bar is birds and game, second one is fish, then fur bearers, wild plants, and then just any resource. And you can see overall, for example, in Igiagig, almost 98% of the population participates. There was a newborn in the community. Igiagig is a small community, so that's pretty much what it was. Um, although we do have, you know, if kids are out berry picking with their parents, even if they're riding on their, their back, they're participating. Or if they're down at fish camp just helping out, you know, they're participating. Um, and, and that's an important cultural component. And I was in Kakanak last week and people kept telling me that, you know, that this is important for our kids to come. Even if they're not, you know, really helping, 
um, it's important for them to be here because eventually they will help. And again, like Nick Clark's Point, Manicota, still very high participation rate. Um, you can see Clark's Point, for example, 96%, very small community. Um, since that time, I, I believe um, they don't have as many people in the community because of the school, um, but there's still, I mean, everybody there really participates. And, and this is Dillingham. So even very central type of community, we, we still see a high participation rate in the harvesting of, of resources. These are what our maps look like. Uh, these are produced by, by Steve Braun and Associates. Um, they produce all our maps for us, um, and they have helped us over time, help build our own GIS capacity to do this ourselves, which has been really great um, in sharing of this, this, this methodology. And so this is um, the hunting of moose in Cockenock, for example, and you can see that although Cockenock is located just on the s south side of the lake, they have a very extensive area for hunting moose. And I don't know if you've been to Ileon Lake. I'm sure some of you are from there, of course. But it is a very, very big lake. Um, and just to go from New Halen, for example, down to the Upper Tularic takes forever in a boat. Um, and so this is a very large area for people to be hunting. Um, and, and these are the, the areas that they're out there searching for moose. And this is um, sockeye and spawning sockeye harvest for the community of Lechnigig which is on um, Lake and Lechnigig, and, and people use an extensive area in this Wood Chick Chick State Park uh, for those two resources. And you can see they go all the way down to the Quijack to fish. And this is the moose for Dillingham. Um, of course, that, that Nishigek River drainage is very important for people to hunt moose. Um, and that's one of their major corridors that they use to, to hunt. If you fly over this area, in a plane, you'll notice that it, it's very tundra-like, and then all of these rivers have trees around them, and that's where the moose are. So it, it's really actually incredible to do that, to fly over this area, and you just see that. You know, every time you pass a river, there's a couple of moose standing in the water. Um, so these river corridors are very important for people. We, this is part of our assessment. Questions we asked people, was your harvest less, same, or more than in recent years? Recent years being about five years. And so these are the, we, this is um, people who said less, and these are the reasons they gave. Personal reasons, of course, are usually at the top of the list. Um, they, they weren't feeling well that year, they just couldn't get out, they were working too much. Um, whatever it was, they, there's, there's always a lot of, of personal reasons. Or their equipment wasn't working, the motor on their boat wasn't working, those kind of things. But there are other reasons, like um, animal population changes over time, of course, um, and, and, or there are other outside effects. So the, the, you, there are lots of reasons why people don't participate, but as you can see from the other charts, there, are, there still is a lot of participation going on. We also look at harvests over time. In 1973, the University of Alaska did a study. So even before the subsistence division was around, there was a baseline study done or Bristol Bay, and we've included this in all of our reports. Um, you can see that uh, for Lechnigig, there were three study years where baseline studies were done, and this is one of the reasons that it was very important for Steve to make sure that he updated the data because the most recent year for Lechnigig, for example, was 1989. That, that data was a generation old, um, and things have changed since then. But have things really changed? Well, you can see here that the harvest over time is still quite high. Um, in all of these resource categories. And for example, if one, one thing I can point out um, before I finish here that I think is, is really important is um, seeing is that although there are maybe a decline in large land mammal harvest, for example, because of the Mulchatna caribou herd moving out of the area, and, and other herds in that area, such as the Alaska Peninsula, um, you can see that people still are harvesting quite a bit and making for it up for it in other resources such as salmon. So if, if one resource is down, they, they make adjustments to their harvesting strategies uh, for the year. And, and these adjustments are constantly ongoing. And as an outcome of this project, we also did put in for a, a project. We did a, a project in Non-Dalton, Port Allsworth, Iliamna, and New Halen looking at strategies people use at fish camps, for example, and how they, how they um, and we did an ethnography of fish camps. So to try to understand some more of the context of this. 
and this is Dillingham harvest over time. And so you can see it's, it's still quite high in many resource categories. If you're interested, uh, these are the publications that we have available that have come out as a result. Um, these are part of our technical paper series. Um, if you go to data and reports on the fishing, subsistence fishing section of the website, I made sure to put a link there uh, for data and reports, and the data will take you to the CSIS, the Community Subsistence Information System. The reports will take you here. And, and you can download any of our reports that we have um, in PDF format. And this is how we distribute them these days. And within a month or so, we'll have the uh, Dillingham report out. That will be the last one. Yes. Okay. This is where I think this, this is where he left off. Thank you, David. And I might point out that he ended on those six reports. Now, those reports, when you say, where's the Pebble EBD or environmental baseline document, those reports aren't attached to that. But as I viewed our job was to make sure there was a sufficient baseline documentation of the subsistence environment I knew those would be publicly available. So the next third party that comes along that's going to write the EIS or the impact assessment, we would expect them to go to those six documents, as well as the database in the community, the online subsistence database. So that stuff's all provided, although it's not in the folder itself or the binders of the EBD. So we'll go next to our our interviews, and we did not do household surveys. We did key, we selected people, and I'll explain that in a minute, to do interviews, and we were looking for active harvesters. We wanted the people that were active out on the land. We didn't ignore elders or inactive people, but we didn't ask them the same set of questions. If we had an elder who hadn't been in the land for 20 years, we would go more into the ethnographic or the cultural resource interview and, and, and we had really adaptive research here because over time as we learned more, we would modify it and adapt to what we were learning. So it took us a while to get to that to say where well, we shouldn't be asking this person about his activities in the last 10 years or last year if he hasn't been out doing anything for 10 years. Let's ask another set of valuable questions to that person. So we did focus on trying to get active harvesters or knowledgeable users. We described the project and explained the benefits. The benefit was primarily information for environmental analysis and mitigation, and also the risks. So this is kind of like informed consent. Before we, someone agreed to it, we had an informed consent form that they would sign, and we would explain to them. The downside is you don't know how someone's going to use this information. We hired local people as liaisons to help us in the community as it was appropriate or they were available. Often our interviews lasted from one, two, three, or in some cases four or more hours. And that gets kind of boring for a local person to sit and ask, and it's really out of context culturally to them to sit down and be asking somebody all these questions and over and over. So primarily they became people that helped us contact people and they were more than welcome to participate, but it just wasn't exactly, it wasn't, didn't fit with their, their lifestyle well. The community would choose who we would interview. We didn't come in and say, oh, we want to talk to certain people. We'd, we'd get it, and I'll explain that in a minute, how that happened. But the community chose the people we interviewed. It was voluntary. We paid an honoraria, and we aggregated all the data and made sure everybody was kept anonymous. So we guided, adopted research principles by the Interagency Arctic Research Policy Committee. We sent introductory letters to each community introducing the project. Beginning in 2008, we got community resolutions from, the, from either the tribal council or if there was no council, uh, no tribal council, whatever organization was active in the community. We didn't do that in Dillingham. It was a large community. And we, did, we completed Dillingham in January 2012. I think ADF and G completed theirs late 2011. I think they did 200 households in their household survey. We did 100 
key in, uh, interviews. So we really, uh, both teams tried to really fo make sure we had a substantial amount of respondents in that community because it's a larger community. We used what's called a snowball method of informant selection. We got a list of active and knowledgeable subsistence users from the coordinating agency. If it was a tribal council, we worked with the council or the administrator and say, okay, here's, here's what our project's about. These are the kind of people we're looking for. Could they give us a list? And once we had that list, we'd start going through that list. And every time we interviewed someone, we'd say, well, now that you see what this interview's about, who else should we talk to? And so we kept snowballing that list and then we'd look at nominations. If somebody, if we'd done 10 interviews and everybody had mentioned Joe over there, we'd say, boy, that's, he's been nominated 10 times. He's obviously pretty important, so let's make sure we get that person. After the field work was done, we would send a confidential letter to the tribal council and we, we would say, here's, who, here's the names of the people we interviewed because we were not doing a household survey what Fish and Game did, they would try a census of all households in the small communities or take a sample like in Dillingham, but we were looking for key people, so it was really important if we missed some people, and in fact, we went back to one community just to talk to one person. We took a special trip because we'd missed that person. So we'd send a list of who we talked to to the community, say, here's the people we're using to characterize your subsistence use areas, because use area is different than harvest amount. Different people may go different places you can take a statistical sample of harvest amounts and generalize to a community, but not necessarily use areas. And we learned this in Barrow in the 80s, that different families do different things. So we wanted to make sure we represented all the use areas of the community. If we didn't get a response on that letter, we'd send another letter. I mean, we bend over backwards in trying, understanding the time clock in these communities wasn't our clock. It wasn't 30 days or 60 days, although we'd say 60 days we'd send another letter in 30 more days and another letter in 60 days or we'd call them so we really would take time to, to get their response. And if they said, no, you didn't have enough interviews, we'd have write in our letter, when should we come back? Didn't you, this week, this week, this week, this week, and we would go back to the community. So the 18 communities that ADF and G has done are listed here in their study years. And then we have gone to 19 communities and. Uh, we have not gone to Manicotuck. We've finished every community, but Manicotuck, we've tried twice to go to Manicotuck, and we're a little more persistent, so we're going to try one more time. So they just have not agreed to participate yet. We started in, the, in uh, Nushigak when ADF and G was over in Iliamna. As you saw on David's map, they were in the Iliamna area, and so we were in the Nushigak first. By the time ADF and G was going to New Shigak, it had become more, the Pebble Project had become more politicized and, and some communities said no thanks. So in the 19 communities, we, and I'm gonna to get to this in a second, we talk, what we did is we looked at last 10 years. We knew ADF and G was gonna do last year and you saw the host of variables they looked at, harvest amounts and sharing and distribution and and it was only last year. So some time ago in, in my research, I thought, because we did a lot of pre-NEPA ba, pre baseline work or affected environment for NEPA, and we had to talk about current conditions. Well, what's current? Is that what you did yesterday or last week or last year? So probably a couple of decades ago, I established in my office to say, well, current for us is gonna be last 10 years. And so that gave us a pretty broad spectrum to be able to go to a community and, and try to and say, look, we want to characterize your current behavior and your current harvest patterns, but we don't want to narrow it down. Maybe for some reason you didn't go somewhere that you would you, you would usually go, and so we didn't want to make it one year. I went to 10 years, and it seemed to work. It seemed to work with agencies accepting it, and it seemed to work in local communities they accept it. So we went to last 10 years, so everything we're going to talk about here is the last 10 years, and we call that current information. We're very GIS and map oriented, and these are the, in these communities, this just gives you an idea of the population of the community, the uh, number of persons identified to talk to is 981. We talked to 648 people in those 19 communities in 356 different workshops 
in, in 38 trips to the 19 communities. So this is a, quite a large number of interviews for 19 communities, and you can see how many were done in each community. There's the 100 in Dillingham. We had a community review meeting presenting our, uh, I don't know if this is fishing game, I'm not, I wasn't sure David was going to be here, so that, I'm not going to go over those two slides, but that's what they did. So we have completed 15 community reports in those 15 communities. We offered to make a presentation in each community. Scheduling that has became increasingly difficult throughout Alaska, not just in Bristol Bay. People are busy and it became quite burdensome, frankly, and often not well attended. So we changed our tactic to say, here's the draft report. We're happy to come and do a presentation, but on your schedule, and if you'd like one, you let us know. And we made sure that offer was there, but even when we were trying to do them, we only got in, in uh, three presentations, and they were not well attended. The people that came thoroughly enjoyed it, but it's a, it, it's a, they're busy communities. They're, throughout Alaska, they're really inundated with all kinds of activities and projects. We finalized uh, 13 community appendices and to have delivered those to Pebble. Not Nundalton and Equok. Neither of those communities have given, have authorized us to give the report to Pebble. I should explain the, the caveat. What we did is we took each of these reports and we told the community, you get the review of that document before Pebble ever sees it. And so if you don't, if you don't approve of it, if you don't want it to go forward, you hold the cards, it doesn't go forward. And so in those two communities, they have not authorized us to deliver that report to Pebble. So that there's only three copies of the Nundalton report. There's four, one in our office and three in Nundalton, and there's four of Equoc, three in Equoc and one in our office. And they haven't agreed to release it yet, so Pebble has not seen it. So that of the 15 we've done, Pebble only has 13 of them. Aleknagik, Naknik, Clarks Point, and Dillingham is in progress, and we, as I said, we haven't done field work in Manicotuck. So the objective of our studies, as I said previously, to, to, to describe the role of subsistence in the communities, to document and describe historic and current harvests and subsistence uses, current being last 10 years. So everything that goes forward is a 10-year data. And we also tried to gather local perceptions. We, we were looking after habitat. What do people know about habitat? And we talked to areas important for health and abundance, to resources, thinking habitat wouldn't be a word that people really identified with in the communities. We have a local issues and concerns section at the end, just ask as much as Fish and Game does, we don't specify, are you worried about that offshore oil well or are you worried about that mine over there? What's, what are your local issues and concerns? And at the end, we might say, do you have any particular pebble concerns or particular project concerns? We also, for each of the resources we talked about, once we talk about where people go to harvest those activities and the other variables you'll see in a minute, we asked about resource use, abundance, quality, health, migration, and, and distribution. So those are all biological terms. And what we were trying to do is lay the groundwork so the biologists could key into this, what we're calling traditional knowledge or what local people know about resources in their area. So we could, the goal was to get this to be integrated with the biology that was being done in the baseline. And lastly, down here, you probably can't see it, and one of the most important things I think we were trying to do is establish and describe subsistence baseline indicators. So what, what could we provide in these study communities that we could identify now that we call baseline indicators that then could be measured in five more years or 10 more years? Or if a, a mine goes in or a, a well gets drilled or something happens, we've established these indicators now. We've set up measurements for them, and could they come back and be measured later and then talk about the, the change? So in terms of what's a baseline, to us it was status and trends. You know, are, there, are there trends occurring? What's, what's the current status and what are the trends? So we wanted to get a suite of indicators that you, were, you could measure over time 
and could lead to an understanding of the multiple causes. We didn't say the cause because we know how difficult it is to the actual cause. There's no caribou here today. Was that because there's no food or because there's a helicopter flying over and scared them away? So we don't know the answer to that always definitively, but we're trying to prepare and, and establish indicators and ways of starting to get to identifying those causes of change. So here's the indicators that we came up with. The ones in red are the ones that came out of our research, and the ones in black are the ones that you heard David discussing previously. They had others in their report, and some of which he didn't talk about today. He had economic things that he wasn't discussing today, and socioeconomics. But these are the subsistence indicators that hopefully out of this research, combining what we did with what Division of Subsistence did, there'll be a, a measurement of that at this time that then later someone can measure again. And as you heard earlier, what's one of the definitions of science is you want to be replicable. And so that's the idea. Someone could come back in, do the same research, replicate it, follow a similar or the same method, and come up with findings that you can then measure in the future. An example, and you saw, heard this from David, number of resources used, how many did you attempt to harvest, how many did you harvest, how many did you receive, how many did you give away, there's measurements of this. And if, it's, if they're all high now and you come back in 10 years and they're all low, you're saying, well, what happened? There's been a change here that we can measure. Now, what was the cause of that change? And again, these are probably similar numbers that David had in different communities. Those are just the different values for those different indicators. So, again, per capita range, this is for the first 1080 FNG study communities from 132 to 977 pounds. You can look at it for a mean across the communities. You can look at each different community, how many resources were harvested, and so on. How many households were participating? How many households was the percentage of sharing? So, now to our specific interviews, I said we focused on active hunters. Primarily, we also had retired elders and retired hunters. We did a lot of, we did all the resources. We decided we weren't going to pick key resources. We weren't going to do that. We just, we went down the whole gamut of resources. We did it for the last 10 years. We looked, what were the months you did that activity for that resource? How successful were you in that harvest? How many times did you go there? What was your, we looked at harvest season. So when's the seasonality in the last 10 years to be compared with last year? What are the travel routes? We identified camps and cabins, and then again, meant, talked about changes in use, abundance, distribution, migration, and health of resources, and then issues of concerns. So now we're only going to talk about 12 communities. That's the 12 communities in the environmental baseline, 10 of which were delivered to Pebble because the other two hadn't agreed to, to release their report. So we're only talking about, but this is, we, here's the, 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 find, the method of the 12 communities, and you can see that by the different geographic features in GIS, cabins, camps, harvest areas, and so on, we had 26,000 uh, geographic features in our mapping report. We consolidated all the resources into 15 categories. Some are species-specific, caribou, moose, and other large land mammals. Seals were specific, but fish, we had fish and salmon and non-salmon, waterfowl, we lumped together, and so upland birds, eggs, berries, and so this, this was a long dialogue in our office over a winter of how we should categorize these, which ones we should lump, which ones we should break out, and we came up with these 15 different categories, and that's the category that we report the findings under. Now, we also went from day one, I said, okay, we're going to go out and find every conceivable existing subsistence mapping that they have for Bristol Bay, and we're going to get it into our, into our data and get it into our reporting. Even if they're only paper copies, then we'll digitize them, and so we did that, and we got back as far as the 1960s. A lot of this was ADF and G, or earlier mapping stuff, and then lastly, our last 10 years. So we do include all the available mapping that we could identify for Bristol Bay. So then the use areas, 
that we're talking about now and by you, sir, is where did you go in the last 10 years for Caribou? What time of year, what, what months did you go there? How, how successful when you went there? And we, we drew polygons, and so for those 12 communities, there were 17,000 use areas. And then there were this many for each of the resources. Now, as I said, we were somewhat adaptive in our research. So if you look at berries, you can see there's 3,000 use areas in berries. So we were kind of making this whole method up as we went, and we struggled early on because we didn't standardize it adequately, and we had different researchers that were really interested in berries, so they started saying, oh, well, blueberries, crowberries, blackberries, raspberries, cranberries, and so it got broken down where maybe someone who wasn't so interested said berries. And so we had to even that out over time, and, and we, in fact, have two data sets we're now trying to reconcile so we can lump the, the first 12 with the last eight communities because we have to get rid of that glitch of when some were berries and some were different species of berries. So then in the first 12 commu communities, we go down to those indicators and that's we report it by resource. So we talk about each community, what was the area that the, that, that community used, we describe it. There were approximately 150 individual species harvested in those 12 communities. Subsistence was year-round with peaks in the summer, early fall, and the late winter. And one of the key marks of what we did is we used the 1 to 250,000 uh, scale map, USGS map. We put the acetate on the top of it. And this is a photo I took one day. There were 11 maps from a community of mylars sitting on the table. And it really just got to show you the value of GIS because if you walk by and look at those 11, you can think of 468 of them all stacked up, and pl the plastic on top of a map. You look at it and say, huh, how do, I, how do I make sense out of that? And it really is a good education for the value of GIS. So when we, di we digitize all those, we scan them and digitize them, and we digitize all the polygons, points, and lines. That's the three features that GIS can handle. And it's usually just in a polygon, represented in a polygon. We always called that a, a, a spaghetti map because it just was a whole bunch of lines. It looked like a big pot of spaghetti. And this one has, I think there's 17,000 polygons on that figure, and that's just the raw data. And as you saw in the fish and game maps that we made for them, the typical way of representing those 17,000 polygons would be like this. And it was years ago on the on another mining project that the mining manager came into my office and said, gee, I just want to see what you're doing. And I said, well, here's we're making these maps, and we got a map that looks like this. And, we, and, we, and when we're all done, we do put the mine site on the map so you get for reference. And he looked at that, and he said, well, that's not fair. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're telling me that all that area, first of all, he said, huh, well, that's easy. We're only going to affect that little dot, and they got that whole big area. They're, we're not going to have an effect on their activity at all, are we? And I said, well, no, it doesn't work that way. And then he said, well, okay, but that's not fair because you're telling me all that's equal, that that, that, that that area right there is as important to that area, that area, that area. There's no way of differentiating the use of those 17,000 use areas. And I struggled, and I thought, you know, he has a point that we need to – try to filter this somehow. How can we start to make, how can we add knowledge to this science? How can we make it replicable and, and, and move the ball forward? So what we did, in a, and it was with the Pebble Project, is we took all, each polygon and we divided it into a 100 meter grid, and then we assigned a value of one for each 100 meters, and then I hired programmers and said, okay, write me a program when I stack all the polygons up that every 100 meters it can count the number ones going down 100 meters. And by doing that, then you turn that map into something like this. And it, it just visually gives you a, great, a much better sense of, what, of what, where more people are going more often. So it's only overlapping polygons, overlapping use areas. It's not where they're more successful. It's not how long they stay there or how much they get there. So it's not what we called intensity. It's not a measure of importance. And we tried that. We took all those variables we had, success, number of pounds harvested, everything we had, and we said, let's put that in there and see what that looks like. 
Well, I bought a brand new Dell computer, and we set it up on Friday, and we came. We just took Caribou for one community. We came back Monday morning, and it was still cranking along. And when it finally got done later in the week, and we looked at it, it didn't look a lot different. And I said, well, let's just go this far at this time and save the rest of that for a future endeavor. So we stuck with just doing this methodology. So then I'm just going to briefly show you. That was, that was 12 community. Whoops page up. There we go. That was 12, 12 communities and the 17,000 polygons, and I'll just run down this very briefly. That's just New Halen, and you see in every one when we make the map, we put the mine site in it, and you can see even in New Halen, just like what David was talking about, look at the importance of those rivers. So people in New Halen might be going visiting somewhere else, and they're using those rivers. Igiogic, Iliamna, and Iliamna, it's interesting, you know, somebody had an airplane, and so, or more than one person had an airplane, so they had a pretty broad use area. Kakanok, Kaliganik, Leavelock, Stoyahook, Pedro Bay, Portage Creek, Port Allsworth. When we were in, in, in Inequoc in 2004 in October, the people, the people at that meeting said, Capture our travel routes and trails. They're very important to us. They could be potentially affected by any kind of development. We want to make sure that you document our, tra our important travel routes. And so we did that for each community. And it gets, they're pretty interesting. You know, if you, that was, uh, whoops, that was New Halen, Igiogic, Iliamna, you know, Kakanok. It's just like, it, and you can see how wide ranging people were, are traveling in a travel route. Kaliganek, Leavelock, New Stoyahook, Pedro Bay, Port Allsworth, and Portage Creek. All of these are in, the, in each of the community reports in the appendix. So I'm just going to briefly show you, what, just pick one community, New Halen, and pick one resource, Caribou. And so the first thing we did is we talk about, well, what's the use area? We describe it in words. We talk about the square miles. We talk about where the highest overlap of the use areas are, and then we compare it with previous map information from other years. So there's the caribou use area for the last 10 years, and we talked about all the historic map data. We give the historic caribou maps for that community or whatever resource we're talking about, and then we compare it and talk about, hmm, the last 10 years was fairly similar to this year, or it was larger, and then why was it larger? Well, it was, Caribou was larger, someone had an airplane, and it was also larger people. We, if someone, we interview them in Iliamna, they live in Iliamna, but they have relatives in Stoyahook, and they go visit them, and they go hunting from there, it got captured in Iliamna, because that, that was part of their use area as they move around. So that, and then lastly, oh, we gotta, we gotta use more area, the Caribou aren't here, we have to go farther to get the Caribou. Then we took each of the resources we asked about the success. Are you always successful usually or, or unpredictable? And so we go down each resource and you compare it to all resources. So in Caribou you can see they were usually success, uh, successful but not always successful. In fact, it's somewhat lower than, uh, than all resources altogether, which makes sense because Caribou aren't as available, they're not in the area as much for different reasons. Talked about the frequency of trips, lots of frequency of trips, in the, and it's, it's pretty amazing the number of trips people take for key species you'll see here in a minute. Then we took all those polygons and we asked, you know, what month do you go there? And then we could make, make it by the month along the bottom, and you could see that the spikes for caribou are August and, and September, but it's year-round. It's an important resource. I mean, they really, it's a desirable resource. The number uh, and percent harvesting, we asked about, did you see changes? We asked each resource, what did you see changes in? And it's pretty much half the people saw a change, they had a change in use, abundance, quality, distribution, migration. So we would also ask, well, what was that and why do you think that occurred? So we tried to take it one extra level. And those are some of the reasons that people had noticed changes. 
decreased presence of caribou in the area, rising cost of gasoline, change of migration from the village. So they talked about the reasons why they had the change. And then we, when, when people come to work for me, we have what we call the typing test. And that's because we use two people for all these interviews. One person is mapping on the mylar asking the questions and the other person is typing really fast the notes. And we turn those notes, you see these are in quotation marks. So what was your observation and what do you, why, do you think, why do you think that? So we took it one step further to try to explain more why. And, and we don't use tape recorders and I had a great, I'm, I'm glad I, I'd had a, I, I did it many, many years ago and it took too long. And one of my employees is a graduate student here in anthropology and he's doing his master's and he had to do X number of interviews in the Arctic Coast community and he, part of it he had to transcribe it and type them and, and listen to his transcription. So he's been since last fall still doing it and when I talked to him I said, well, how's that going? And at first he was really gung-ho and now he's finally told me that he thought it was, it was, he had 10 hours per hour. And so I did the math last night thinking about our project and I thought, huh, well we did, what did we have, 650 interviews. Let's say they had lasted two hours. I think we would have been four years, we wouldn't, we'd still be transcribing. <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here. So I, I'm just glad, because I'm a little suspect, we can't, we put it in quotes, but we can't be 100%. But I have a couple of employees that are sitting over there are pretty fast typers, and so we try to do that, because we really try to capture the words that people have said. So we also ask about habitat areas. It was not so successful in hindsight, because we'd just gone through where do you do all these activities, and then to come back and ask about the key areas of importance. We struggled with that somewhat, but we did follow through with it in this project. And then that was just caribou, and we go through all the 15 categories for each community, and then you have a community report. And at the end, we do all resources. So we just talk about, we lump all the resources. Where was the use area for all the resources? How successful were you for all resources? What were the primary resources you were the most successful for? You know, it's interesting, marine invertebrates, and if you look down here, caribou is way down here. So it's, it's not, on a, it's very desired, but you don't get it as often. Same thing with all resources, frequency of trips. So we're, as I said, we're trying to set up these baseline indicators that then could be replicated. If you come up and all these numbers are skewed or different in the future, you can then start to look for why. So interesting here, the U-series visited more than six times a year, so there are seals. So Obviously, it's something you don't hear a lot about, freshwater seal in Lake Iliamna, mostly over in a certain subset of communities. But boy, another way of looking at the data, they, they, it was the one resource people went for the most in those communities. Travel methods, again, because we ask them, how did you go to that area? So boat, of course, is the big one, but we covered snow machine, four-wheeler, truck, and so on. And then this is the seasonal round. It's by those different polygons. When did you go there? So as you can see, it's the dead of winter. November, December is a little bit slower, but it's a year-round activity. And then we lump what were the most changes, which resources did the people have talk about had the most changes? And then what were those changes and why? And then what resources did people report the most changes on. Then we ask about issues and concerns. And here we had competition with, this is just a generic question, and competition for resources with sport hunters and sport fishing, effect of rising gas prices, climate change affecting winter travel. And then project specific concerns came out, concern for the watershed, contamination of the watershed and wildlife, helicopter traffic, that we hear that throughout the state on development projects, regardless of where it is. Helicopters make noise and, and, and affect the game. Economic benefits to the community, local economy, with a project coming in the area. Social concerns, influx of outsiders. Current status, we've submitted the 
EBD chapters for 10 communities, and I already went through the ones that didn't give approval. These are in process. Dillingham's in process, Flux Point, Electnagik. We did not characterize the west side of Cook Inlet yet. But that we, we've done literature review on that, but we haven't done any work there. That was, and then we have that remaining, finish those reports, and then a synthesis. And we haven't started that synthesis, which really should be the EBD. You'd be reading a synthesis with appendices of individual chapters, but we can't do that till we finish all 20 communities. And again, the status, you've got heard from ADF and G where they are, <coughs> and they've finished their last report. It's in draft form at this time under review. And I think there's 19 or 20 people here from my office that have worked on this project since 2004. I want to acknowledge them. There's been a lot of effort and a lot of good work, and also to, to thank the communities. So that's, if you have any questions, I'll answer them. If not, you can move to your. Okay, thank you. We'll get to the we'll get to the questions um, we'll get to the questions a little bit later um, directly for for Stephen and uh, David. But I want to tell I'll, we'll give you all a 15 minute break right now. Uh, so let's do that. Well, when we come back, we'll uh, set up the the panel discussion. So thanks again.